So we've been uh, writing a little bit of code, some HTML tags. And the thing about HTML in most programming languages is that there's dozens, if not hundreds, of commands to master. But you don't have to master all 200 commands in HTML, 200 bits of code, to be a pro and to even do what we're going to do in this class. There's a few dozen that we'll learn, but you don't need to learn all 200 tags or whatever amount there are. I don't know how many there are at the moment. And there's new ones coming out all the time. That's why I've got that, those, those two books in the syllabus. If you want to learn more of HTML, even in three months, we're not, if it was three months nonstop of HTML, we'd probably be able to cover everything about HTML. But we've got a lot to cover. And we don't need to know everything about everything. We don't need to know about, uh, you know, D, DD tags for this project at all. We don't need to know about, uh, I don't know, the Q tag for this class. So if you'd like to further your knowledge of HTML, there's many websites out there. Here's one of many. Uh, if you'd like to go over at some point, perhaps, w3schools.com. This is one of many websites out there where you can go and learn HTML, CSS, JavaScript, PHP, what else, JSON, Angular, SVGs, or SVG, ASP, all of this stuff for free. You can go here and learn all of these languages. You can go to the reference and look up every single HTML tag and what it does and examples and all of that. And you can go then lesson by lesson and earn certificates. So you can earn certificates for your work. I don't know exactly the value of the certificates. They do look good on a resume and such, but I don't know, you know, credit-wise, they're not like, it's not like college credit or anything like that. But you can go through this system, learn all of these languages, further your, your education, because if, even if this class were three months nonstop, Monday through Friday of HTML, we, wouldn't, we really can't cover everything. There's so much to learn. This is one place. Does anyone have an opinion of any other place that you'd like to go to learn about HTML and coding and such? <coughs> What's that? Code Academy. Code Academy, that's another big one. Codeacademy.com. So there's plenty of places out there for you to learn a variety of coding languages for various, uh, for free and for not free and all of that. Here's another one, Code Academy. Anyone else know any other place that you like? Yeah. What's that? Tutorial points. Com. Tutorial points. points. Dot com. Hmm. Hadn't hadn't heard of that one. I might have typed it wrong. Tutorial. Tutorial points. Point. point. Tutorial point dot com. Points. Tutorials. Tutorialspoint.com. There we go. Thank you. Tutorialspoint.com. Simply easy learning. I hadn't heard of it, but you learn Rails, Joomla, Drupal, Node, etc. So, oh, and it looks like they're hiring. So after you learn how to program, then <laughs> get hired. Uh, so plenty of places for you to learn this these things. Um, you don't need to, to master all of the code to be a master to make an app. But if you go to various places like here, go to the reference and go look up all of the HTML tags. Here's all the tags right here and what they do. We're never going to use um, I. You shouldn't use it anyway. We're never going to use um, Param. You shouldn't use that one either. Q and RP. I don't know what RP is. So I don't know them all either. But I, need to, I know the ones that I need to know for the project I need to do. And if I don't know something, I look it up. I go to these places and look it up. Or I go to also this other amazing website. Um, uh, what's it called again? Stack Exchange. StackExchange.com. Stack, Stack Overflow, yes. Stack Exchange is the big parent spot where you can go look up information on all the important stuff like coding, programming, Harry Potter, etc. But Stack Overflow, Stack Overflow is specifically the one about uh, programming. Stack Exchange is the parent organization. 
and Stack Overflow is the one all about programming. And I've gone here several times to look things up, to ask questions and get answers, and um, it really works. Another place that I like to go, because not everyone can know everything, no one knows everything, especially in programming, uh, if, you go, if you go to um, plus.google.com, plus.google.com, this is Google Plus, there are various programming communities on Google Plus where you can go talk to real people about programming and ask questions, and I've gone to both. Um, so I'll, I'll, put it, I'll put these in my notes. We've got w3schools.com, we've got codeacademy.com, tutorials point, Dot com stack overflow and plus .google .com. places to learn more coding places to check if you get stuck In addition to books, plenty of books out there. The ones that I have in my syllabus are very good, uh, but this is much more up to date because a book, of course, has to be written and published, and then it goes out of date and has to be republished, and they may never republish it. These things are always up to date. And so, getting back to our code. <coughs> Um, this is what we've created so far. Um, let's um, add some more HTML. So far we've just been adding text content, but HTML can also be used to display graphic content, sound content, video content, links, all that great stuff, maps, etc. And so let's say at this point I want to display a graphic on screen. I want to display um, some sort of picture in addition to this text. So if you click, uh, let's add, let's go after line 13, you should be seeing that the order <coughs> of the code that we write is represented in the web browser. I wrote the h1 tag, it appeared first, I wrote the p tag last, it appeared last. So the order that I write my code does matter. It matters more when we get to, for example, CSS and JavaScript. Um, but for the moment, we're going to say we're going to add a picture, an image, on line 14. There's an image tag. And when this was being invented, uh, it was not invented as being written as the word image. It's IMG. <clears throat> an image also is one of the 1% that does not have a pair. So we don't have a pair of image tags. What we do have, though, are attributes. What else describes this tag? We've got a tag, but what else about it? We need to say, for example, the picture. What picture are we talking about? So we need an attribute. When we add an attribute to a tag, we add it inside of the tag, meaning before the ending bracket, angle bracket, less than greater than angle brackets. These things have different names. Inside of the angle bracket, Add a space, so it's image, img, space, and then the angle brackets. And the attribute that we need to say is, well, what picture are we talking about? What's the source of our picture? So we will write src, source, equals, quote, the quote is right next to your enter, right, your double, your double tick mark right there, quote, ending quote, we're going to see over and over that if we need to add an attribute to a tag, it will be in this format. The name of the attribute, and that one, there's dozens of those attached to an, a tag, and the format is attribute equals quotes something there, value, the value of that attribute. And so here, if we had a picture, something like cat, 
JPEG, right here we've described show the cat picture on this website. If we were to do this, however, we would, uh, we would get a broken link, a broken picture. There's no picture called cat, so it's a broken picture. <coughs> it's broken because I've saved my project on my flash drive. It's right there on my flash drive. And I'm, in the code I'm writing, display the cat picture. There's no cat picture in that folder. That's why it doesn't work. So we're going to borrow a picture that we have on the computer. We're going to copy that picture and paste it to the location where you have your project, and then write the code to show the picture. My project is on my flash drive in a folder called Android One. Yours might be on the desktop or somewhere. I don't know where you put your file. But I've got a sample picture for you. If you open computer window on the desktop, open computer, on the left panel, on the left side, go to pictures, library, you should see at the very top, picture, uh, libraries and pictures, open pictures and you'll see sample pictures, open sample pictures, we've got a few to choose from. I don't have a, koala, a cat but I have a koala. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to right-click, copy the koala, and then in my project folder, right-click, paste. We have several ways to link a picture. Here's one way, one very direct way. We need a picture in the same location as the HTML code so that we, when we write the code, it finds the picture. <coughs> so our code should then be image source equals koala dot jpg. Try that. Save and run it. And if it worked, you should have a, a koala picture on your, <coughs> on your website. Now, we didn't say anything about its size, so it's big. It's a big koala coming at us. We'll fix that in a moment. But, oops, but also notice I wrote capital K koala. You might not have, and it worked. It might have worked because, again, the web browser might have been lenient and understood the code and showed you the picture. Technically, though, if you didn't write the capital K, it was wrong, because case will matter in some instances like this, uppercase and lowercase, will matter in some instances. So that's why we want to keep everything consistent, consistently lowercase, for example. Did I put a capital K there or a lowercase? Don't worry about it. Keep it all lowercase. This particular file has a capital K. So I'll keep it capital K. But if the file has a lowercase k, I would use a lowercase k. So did everyone get that uh, koala picture to appear? We didn't say anything about a size for the picture. We can do this two ways. First we'll do it the not the best way, then we'll do it the best way later. One way to do this is to add another attribute here. We've got an attribute of what picture? The source of the picture. We need an attribute. Well, what size for the image? So we'll add another attribute, which means it's also inside of, <coughs> inside of the tag. So after your koala picture, quote, space, we add another attribute. This one will be width. <coughs> we can define the width and the height of the picture. Width equals quote, end quote. Another attribute in the same format. Name of an attribute equals a value. The value, let's say I'm going to pick 200px. No space there. 
200 pixels, 200 units of size. Save it and run it and see what happens. Now, we can define the width and the height of the item. We can say a width, we can say a height, we can say other attributes. It's a little squashed. But I can set different attributes. Now it looks a little stretched. If I only have a width that keeps it in proportion. So we'll be going into all of these details a little later. I'm just showing you that we can add a picture. We can style it a little bit, doing an, an attribute here. Later on, I said this is not the best way to do it, because later on when we learn CSS, that's a better way because we can define the size more accurate, accurately. We can use CSS to rotate the picture, to flip the picture, to add a drop shadow to the picture, to colorize the picture. We can do a lot with CSS. HTML, again, is more for structure. As I said in my notes, structure. Laying out, in general, my content of my design, but the design will actually be controlled usually by a CSS. So this is, a, this is a, a design, a presentation feature here. And we can do it. We can set sizes and such. But it would be better to set this with CSS when we learn CSS a little later. I'll just leave some values here. It doesn't matter what you put. But I'm going to leave it simply as width of 200 pixels pixels are the dots on the screen. 200 little dots, approximately. 200 dots wide. <coughs> pixels. So that assumes we had a, um, a graphic to show in the same folder. Later on we can get more complex and you don't have to do this, but what we could do is we could put a web address here, a fully uh, correct and complete web address. I could put a, a website address directly to a picture, and that would go off to the internet, grab the picture basically, and show it on your screen. This is not going to work. Uh, that's not a real address. But if we had some sort of online resource, that'll work as well. This one is assuming it's in the same folder. We can also uh, create uh, basic graphical elements with our le level of knowledge here. We can create, for example, a dividing line. Uh, I want to divide up. Actually, I want to back up. I thought about this. I want to create a dividing line right here. I want it to say Android apps and summer and then a divider and then my name and the picture. I want a dividing line. So let's back up. At approximately what line might I go to to add a new divider on screen? Uh, probably line 11, yeah. I'm going to need to push down what's already there. So back up to 10, <coughs> enter to give yourself a new line 11. So go to the end of line 10 and press enter. New line 11. And I reasoned that because I can see summer on screen and then I can see instructor, so in between I want something else. So the order of this, of course, then matters. And I want to create a simple horizontal line. We've got a tag for that. It's the HR tag. This one is another example without a pair. <coughs> we can give it attributes and such, but just basically like this, let's see what this looks like. Save it, run it, and we'll see what the HR tag does. HR creates a horizontal rule, a horizontal ruler, basically a line, a simple line that goes across the screen, a little graphical element. So 
So um, HTML is hypertext markup language. That's what the initial stands for. <coughs> hypertext, hypertext, markup language. We've been seeing the ML part of it so far, markup language. We've marked from here to here as the body, from here to here as a paragraph, from here is an image. We've been doing the markup part. We haven't done the hypertext part of it yet, and hypertext is just a fancy term uh, for links. This document linked to another document. If you read up on the history of the web, it's very fascinating, and in short, it goes back to a student in Europe who developed a new language. Uh, his name was um, Tim Berners-Lee. Uh, he's British. He's still alive. And he developed this language, HTML, to, to link different documents. He had this one document and wanted to have a word that you can click to then open this document. Nowadays, obvious. Links. 27 years ago, not so obvious. Someone had to think of it. So um, Tim, he's actually been knighted, so Sir Tim, uh, created a way for you to click on one thing to go to another. So we will do exactly that. We will use the code that he invented uh, to link between this document and another document. We need to write HTML for hypertext links. So let's say we want to make uh, we want to make my my name here, Instructor Victor Campos. We want to make that an active link. We want to make that so that you can click on it to go to my website. That requires a tag. So let's back up to line 13. And when Tim was inventing this, he never thought of calling this the link tag. He called it the A tag. A for anchor. So between this A tag and this closing A tag will be an active link or anchor text. There is a link tag. It does something totally different. We'll look at it later. But this tag here is to link my name to my website. Am I done? Why not, maybe? No attribute. What am I linking to? Image says show that picture. That's a link, but what link? So we need an attribute for the A tag. Let's back up to the A tag, the first one up here. Press space there. These attributes get added inside the tag as we've seen. And attributes can be added to the single tag or to the tag that has a pair. But we always add the attribute to the starting tag of the pair. We would not add it to the slash A or the slash P. You would add attributes to the P or the H1, not the slash h1. So we need an attribute. We need the website. href, hypertext reference. We need to say what website does this link to? Same syntax as before. Attribute equals value. So attribute equals value. href equals quote end quote. And inside of that you can put any web address, but let's say we'll link it over to my, one of my websites, http colon slash slash vmcink.net. It does need the http colon slash slash part. It does need the protocol, or else it might not work. So I'm linking off to a web, I'm linking off to something, I'm, I'm going off to a link on the web with the full web address. Save and run that and see what it looks like, see how it works. Here's before, here's after. It's got the underline, like I've seen for links. I put my mouse over my name, and the little hand appears. If, you're, if the link hand also appears on your picture, that means you did not end your A tag. Remember, I'm marking. Only my name is clickable. 
if I also wanted the koala to be clickable, I would need to wrap this A tag around it as well. If you didn't close this A tag, it wouldn't know, well, where does your link end? So it would continue to make everything that follows a link. That's what I'm getting at. Your picture should not be clickable yet. We didn't mark it as clickable. We've only marked the name as clickable. And so then if I click, it goes off to my website. I have to press back to get back, which is kind of annoying, actually. You've probably seen websites where you click on a link and it opens in its own window or its own tab. Let's do that. We can do that very easily. I want my website to appear in a separate window so that when you're done looking at my website and you close it, you don't lose this website. I want it to open in a separate window. That's going to be another attribute of the A tag. We've got the href attribute. We need one more attribute. Just like we added two attributes for image, we can add multiple attributes to most tags. So after the href quote space, we'll add another attribute. This one is target. Same syntax equals quote end quote. What's the target of this link? How do you want to open it? Where do you want to open it? And the target is going to be underscore blank. That's the underscore symbol, which is right next to your, it's, it's dash. It's shift dash on the keyboard. It's right next to the zero. There's dash, and then shift dash is underscore. So underscore, no space, underscore blank. Save and run that, and what happens is when you click the link, it should open in its own separate tab. <coughs> click that, and notice it opened it up. Hello World is still there, and now I've got my website. I close my website, Hello World is still there. That's, that's the point of that. The point of that also is that with HTML, there are a lot of defaults built in. The default was, well, open that link in the same window. No, I wanted something else. I wanted to change the default, so I added this attribute. When we do CSS in just a moment, a lot of what CSS is is to override the defaults. But uh, all of these tags have a built-in default that can be changed. This is what we have so far. Any, any questions so far? <coughs> so everything that we've been creating here basically are structural tags, structural HTML. We are creating um, we are creating tags to um, to put content on screen, like placeholders to put content on screen. And all of these tags we've used so far actually um, have been basically um, HTML version 1.0 tags. We're using the latest standard, which is HTML5, and it's not marked up here as HTML5, but this is HTML5. But everything we've written is basically HTML1 so far. This is like from the beginning, nothing new, nothing special. Let's write a brand new modern HTML5 tag. And the thing with using the latest code is that that would mean then older web browsers, older computers, perhaps even older devices might not be able to handle the newest versions of the code. We'll have a deeper discussion on that later. But let's assume that we've got a modern computer and a modern browser and this will work fine. But we're going to write an HTML5 specific tag. Let's say after our image, give yourself a new line 16. We have this brand new tag because as the evolution of the web went on, web designers often over and over were creating various sections of their website over and over, such as a footer. 
they were creating a section down at the bottom of the screen to put the copyright over and over and over. So eventually, as the language evolved, the footer tag was invented for that purpose, to put content into it that would then go at the bottom of the screen. So we have a footer tag. F-O-O-T-E-R, footer. That one has a pair, because you have to mark where does it start and where does it end. So the theory behind this relatively new tag is whatever is in here should be at the bottom of the page, or at, the, at least at the end of the page. And what we'll do is we'll write copyright 2016. You can write your name or pick up a company or whatever. I'll call this victorapps.net or something, or LLC. Save and run that. See what it looks like, see what it does. Now, I thought that it was going to put it at the bottom. The instructor keeps saying this goes at the footer. Well, the footer has the meaning that this is content at the end of the document. This is at the end of the document. The document ends right there after the picture. That doesn't necessarily mean at the bottom of the screen, however, because that is a design consideration. Conceptually, the footer is the last thing. Visually, that's another matter. Visually, if we do want this at the bottom of the screen, we have to deal with it in a different way, which we'll get to later, which will be CSS. That's the design aspect. Remember these three pillars again? HTML for the structure, CSS for the design, JavaScript for the interaction. So this is correct. It's not putting copyright down at the bottom like I'm expecting it. But this is the correct tag to use at this point because it's the last thing on the page. Later on, we'll put it in the right spot, of course. But what we're dealing with when we deal nowadays with HTML5 code, making a note here, HTML5 is semantic, semantic HTML. It has meaning. These tags have a meaning. The meaning of footer is it's the last thing on the page. It's at the bottom. To make it look at the bottom, then we have to deal with CSS. We have a meaning to the P tag. It's a paragraph. We have the meaning of the IMG tag. It's for images. We have a meaning for H1. It's a big, bold heading. Meaning tags with meaning. And if you're new to HTML, this is sort of like a given. Yes, it's obvious this is what it's about. For us that have had experience in HTML throughout the years, though, this is a big thing because, for example, people would, would, would abuse HTML. Uh, basically, the mantra is the right tag for the right task. There's a tag, there's a code for a specific thing you're trying to do. And in the old days, the tags would be abused, meaning they would, the wrong tag would be used for the wrong task. One common thing to do in the old days was to use the table tag for layout. My syllabus has a, has a table on the, on the second page, this, this table with, with rows and columns. It's a calendar. It has a purpose. The first row is the first week. The second row is the second week. It has a purpose. This is a table. But what people would, would do in the old days is they would say, well, if I can design a table, what if I'm using a table to make a column on the edge of my page and making a row so that it's at the footer? So using the table for design, which is not what the table was made for. The table was made to display data like this, not for design. So if you're an old-timer with HTML like me, in the dark days, people would use tables and other tags the wrong way. For us, since if you're starting from the beginning of all of this stuff, I'm showing you the most modern, current, correct way. The right tag for the right task. Which in short is that footer tag. Let's say here under copyright 2016, I wanted to display the actual copyright symbol. 
we can do that. If you back up to copyright right there, and we type the ampersand, which is shift 7, which is the and symbol, the ampersand, the ampersand, no space, <coughs> copy, no space, semicolon. It should italicize if you typed it right. That will turn into the copyright symbol once you run it. There's a whole list of all of these special characters all over the web over at w3schools.com. If you need to look up these special characters and display them on your screen, you, you can do so. For example, let's say for some reason you need to display uh, the yen symbol. You're dealing with Japanese yen. So you would type ampersand yen, semicolon, the euro, the euro monetary unit, euro. We have different special characters that we can that we can access. Well, we have some other fun things there as well. We can do hearts, plural, get a little heart, spades, clubs. You can do happy faces and frowny faces, emoji, all of that stuff. So basically you can put all of these special symbols. You don't have any graphic ability. There's a whole collection of symbols that you can use. When we get to the point of actually making the app, we can put in some cool icons, a little house for the home icon, uh, a little person for the user icon, um, you know, a little X for the cancel icon. We have a variety of icons that we can, that we can work with. Um, either via typing in its its character code here or copying and pasting. Let's say we wanted to do something like this. I want to write <coughs> Ole, but Ole should have the accent mark on the E. So that would be ampersand E acute semicolon. What that does is it does Ole. A special character in the in the middle of the rest of the characters gives me that. I don't have them all memorized, just enough of them to impress people. Uh, but uh, here's what we've got a few here, and if I want to look any of them up, I can go uh, over to W3 Schools. I can go to References. We have um, I think it's over at HTML Character Sets. Where is it at? References. ASCII. It's in here somewhere. Oh, symbols. HTML symbols. There you go. You can do uh, mathematical symbols, Greek letters, arrows. <coughs> so if you do ampersand L A R R that'll create a left arrow. We need the trademark ampersand trade semicolon. <coughs> For fun, let's check this out. Go to your web browser and go to getemoji.com. There's a website here that has all the emoji. You can look them up and you can just copy, select, copy, and paste it into your code. And depending on your web browser, it'll show you the it'll show you the symbol. Here's another place where you can go and get all of these icons. I don't have any artistic ability, but I can copy and paste. I can take this and make a graphic in Photoshop, and there's my app's icon. So I can go, I can go here to copy and paste these these symbols. 
You can also go to uh, emoji1.com. This one will also give you variations of the emoji. These are all downloadable. They're graphics. So here I want the little dead guy. I can download that and use it in my app, although this is copyright free. This is over at, at emoji1.com. because eventually we're going to need to deal with uh, graphics for our app. We may be really good in, in programming and such, and oftentimes I see people that are very good in one side of it, programming, and not so good in the graphics side. You don't have to be great with graphics. We'll have various resources that we can get for free out there to help us to develop our app. As a matter of fact, I'm working on an app right now. Yesterday I came here to get emoji, and I came over here. I needed the, uh, I needed the, gas, the gas pump emoji somewhere here I needed a I needed a fuel pump for this app so you can um, you can download it from here and it's high quality so that that's free for you to use Now everything that we've been writing so far has been plain old HTML, except for footer, which was HTML5. What we should also do is talk about um, writing comments in our code. All of this code we've written so far is not complex. We can easily get very complex. And let's say you're working on your project and you put it down on Thursday, and then you come to work on it again on Tuesday, and you forgot. It was a long weekend. And so you forgot what your code does. You can write comments in your code, notes for yourself, that explain to yourself what your code does. This is also useful because if you're working in, an, in, a, in a team, someone is in charge of the home screen, and someone else is in charge of the about screen, and someone else is in charge of the database screen. Everyone's going to be working on different parts of the code. You can write each other notes as well. So we have HTML comments. It's written with the HTML comment tag. It's a very specific tag. It does have a pair, but it's very different from the rest. Let's say I want to give myself a note that this footer is HTML5 code. I'm going to give myself a new line 16 above footer. And I'm going to write the HTML comment. And it's written like this, less than exclamation point, dash, dash, everything turns green, everything has become a comment, space, dash, dash, greater than, the green stops. Green means it's a comment, it's a note for yourself, so between those two <coughs> tags, that's a comment, so whatever I write here is a comment and the computer will ignore. Don't write that. Um, the computer is going to ignore this. What I meant to write was the footer tag is HTML5. So I can write comments with this tag, as many as I want. This tag actually can be broken up into multiple lines. I can do it like this. Let's say I'm going to back up to my image, line 15, and I'll write again, angle bracket, exclamation, dash, dash, enter a couple of times, dash, dash, greater than. And now everything I write in between here and here and here, and here. That's all a comment as well. Comment starts here, comment ends here. Anything in between is ignored by the, by the web browser, is not processed. So I can write image tag needs attributes. 
src for the source of the picture. With for the width of the picture, etc. Comments. As we get complex with 100 lines, 400 lines, 500 lines, 700 lines, um, these are very, very valuable. We'll get more used to writing these a little later as we get more complex, especially with JavaScript, for example, because the JavaScript, a lot could go wrong. And as you write comments, um, it's useful to remind yourself what you did or to write a to-do note, because I can write, you know, something's not working, and I'll write a comment here. To do doesn't work. Fix it. You don't have to write this, but I'm just showing you. You can write comments all over the place for various purposes. Another purpose of the comment tag is also to deactivate our code. Right now we've got the footer down here, but let's say I want to. I want to deactivate the footer. I don't want to delete it. I want to leave the code there, but I just don't want the footer to actually appear on screen. I no longer want this to say this copyright stuff. I want to hide that. So what I can do is wrap the wrap the um, comment tag around what I'm trying to deactivate. So let's say I go like this. Dent it. For readability. Comment starts, comment ends. What's in the middle is the footer. That code, which you just saw a moment ago, gets processed and gets shown on screen. Now, as a comment, it doesn't. This simple thing right here is so valuable later on when we get more complex, when our code breaks, when we're trying to figure out problems. It's often a great idea <coughs> to deactivate your code because oftentimes the very last thing you did was what broke things. So if you deactivate that code and work backwards, add it back little by little, double check your spelling. Whoops, I put three O's instead of two O's. That's my mistake. I didn't see it. So deactivating your code and such for debugging. Any questions so far? Let's, uh, there's obviously still much more to learn with HTML, but let's segue to talk a little bit about CSS. We've been talking about CSS so f uh, HTML so far. Let's talk a little bit about CSS. I've said over here, HTML is hypertext markup language. Now we're going to talk about CSS. That's cascading. Style sheets. <coughs> the main takeaway for the moment is style, the S. Style. With CSS, we can control the style of the document. We can center things on screen. We can align things to the right. We can make columns. We can put background colors, drop shadows, animation, transitions. Um, all of that cool visual stuff. And 99% of the time, the CSS is attached to some HTML. You've got some HTML tag like body, and the default of body is a plain white background. I want a yellow background, a pink background, a black background, a gradient background. I want to change the default body style. By default, body tag has a white background. <coughs> actually, trivia, the very first version of HTML, the body tag, actually the default was a gray background. So the very first websites were very ugly drab gray because the body by default was gray. Now it's white. A little bit more pleasant to look at. But we want to override that. We want to add a different color to the background. CSS is the, is the tool for that task. CSS can be used to change the style of any of these elements. And there's 
several ways to write CSS. We're going to write the most easiest and direct way, which is actually not the best way. But we're going to write just the quickest way to, to get our, our mind around it, and then we'll write it better a little later. We're going to add the CSS attribute to the body tag. We've added the href attribute to this and the src attribute to that. We want to add the CSS style attribute to body. Let's back up to body, add a space inside the tag, and this is style equals quotes. That basically means CSS. Let's use CSS to change um, to change elements of the design. We're going to select elements of this of the design and change them. I want to select first of all background dash color. The attribute is style. My selector. I'm selecting the background color. Colon space. Well, what value? What background color should I put? Let's try, for example, red, semicolon. There is a very specific syntax here. We'll see it over and over. What are we changing? What are we selecting to change? How are we changing it? In our case, background color, colon, space, value, semicolon. So it's like, change this, the end, semicolon. Try that. Save it and run it. get an eye-blinding red color. But now we don't have the plain white color, we have a red color. Well, what about instead of red, blue, or yellow, or pink? Try, try different colors. Pink. put pink and it's a lovely shade of Pepto-Bismol. Try different colors. Try a color... Um, what about gold? I'm going to say background color. Gold. That's gold. It doesn't shine. If there's gold. If there's gold, is there silver? Maybe we can try silver. Silver. Okay, gold, silver. Is there a bronze? No. When there isn't a value that exists in CSS, it just ignores it. Bronze doesn't exist, so it ignores it back to the default, white. Um, there's about, I think, 114 colors we can choose from that have a name like that, even some weird ones. Like, um, I think there's one, um, I think it's called Red Brick. Or is it just called Brick? It's not Red Brick, it's Brick. What am I thinking of? Brick Red. Brick Red, maybe? Nope. Okay, here's one I do remember. Bisque. <laughs> there we go. Uh -huh. Well, what, uh, what kind of bisque? Lobster bisque? I don't know. But uh, bisque, this is one of these colors that is invented. A lot of weird ones out there. There's blanched almond. Blanched almond. <coughs> Which looks a lot like bisque to me. But it is different. You see that? Huh. There's also um, Alice Blue. Blue. When they were inventing this, Someone said, hey, let's do Dodger Blue. And they said, sure, there's Dodger Blue. So there's about 114 of these named colors. You can look them up at W3 Schools. Look up the color names, there's 114 of them. But 114 colors is not a lot. There's millions of colors. When you go, when you're going to paint your house and you go to uh, Home Depot to buy a color uh, and you need to buy white, you can say, well, which shade of white? We've got a hundred of them. Eggshell white, bone white, off-white, etc. So we can write color formulas here. Let's do this instead. Instead of a color name, we'll type 
RGB, open parentheses, close parentheses. Here we're going to mix a color with red, green, and blue pigments, RGB, red, green, blue. We're going to mix it. So let's try this. Let's put 100, comma, space 0, comma, space 0. 100 units of red, 0 of green, 0 of blue. Save and run that. You get a shade of red. I'm going to write a note up here. RGB values go from 0 to 255. So I can put RGB, I can put 200, 0, 0. That'll be a stronger shade of red. I can put 50, 0, 0. That'll be a weaker shade of red. I can go up to 255. If I do 200, it's a brighter red. Here's 100, here's 200. And the maximum is 255. Bright red. I can mix in these other colors. I can mix in a little bit of red and a little bit of blue. Let's say 100 units of blue, of blue, which is the third value. Red, green, blue, in that order, RGB. A lot of red, no green, halfway of blue. It's like a, can't see it too well on the screen, but it's like, on my screen, it's like a magenta, purplish kind of color. A little more obvious right there. So 255, 200. And here I can make various shades, various shades of, uh, of a color. This is the tip of the tip of the iceberg of CSS, letting us change the default style of things. White was default, now it's this shade of purple. And we can attach that style attribute to just about everything. We're going to take a break in a moment, but here's something that you can play with, and then we'll do it in a moment. What about if you added style background color to H1? To my H1 tag, I add the style attribute, and I put a different color. Just for quickly, I'll put pink. Does what I told it. In that one element, heading one, it put a different background color than the whole background color of body. Body is the big container. Everything is inside of body because it's all indented. You see that? So it's like this whole sheet of paper. Body. And I've changed it from a white sheet of paper to a purple sheet of paper. And then this top heading up here, I want that to be different. So on a real sheet of paper, I would get like a highlighter and highlight here and make that a different color. In the digital version, I add CSS style <coughs> to the heading 1. And notice again, it's in the angle brackets. If you added it outside of the angle brackets, it won't understand, and your result will look like this. Style background color pink. It'll show it. It won't process it. So that means you didn't put your style inside of your tag, your attribute inside the tag. We'll look at more CSS, of course, but let's, uh, let's take our second break. You have one more thing here to look at that might be interesting to put in other spots. But here's what I've got so far. Um, it's uh, 8.31. We'll take one more break to 8.41. When we come back, we'll look at some more CSS, some more interesting stuff with CSS. And that'll be at 841.